With us today is Morton Hansen. He wrote the book Great at Work, How Top Performers Do Less, Work Better, and Achieve More. It's not just a bunch of good ideas, though it is that, but it's also based on some really strong research, and it's a really interesting book. I'm hoping that we, I'm sure we're going to have a really great conversation. Morton's a management professor at the University of California, Berkeley. He's also a faculty member of Apple University at Apple. He uh, has written Great by Choice with... Um, Jim Collins, and he's one of the thinkers, 50 thinkers, and I love that list, and, uh, and it's always great to get uh, one of the top 50 thought leaders in the world on my show. So, Martin, uh, thank you for coming on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Ah, it's a pleasure. Share with us the big idea of your book, why you wrote this, what the big insight was. The, the big insight is that when we studied 5,000 people in corporate America, we figure out that most people work the wrong way. Uh, in other words, they're spending their working adult life, you know, working in a very ineffective ways, which is sort of wasting your life if you think about it. Right. And one of the key things that people do uh, incorrectly is that they spread themselves too thin, they are working on too many things, and they get very um, anxious and exhausted as a result of that. And some of that is because their boss give them too many things to do and there are too many things going on in the organization. So one of the key principles for success is what I call do less than obsess. It is a two part strategy and that's very important. A lot of people said before me, well, you got to focus, right? You got to do a few things. Uh, and prioritization is just one thing. You got to select a few things that matter. That's the do less part, mm -hmm. but that is not enough. You also need to obsess. You need to go all in fanatic attention to detail and so on, go the extra mile. Because if you don't obsess over the few things that matter, somebody else, some other colleague, some competition is going to do many things and they will accomplish a lot of things and you're just doing a few things, but you have to do those few things exceedingly well. So being very good at few things is what really matters. And that means you have to obsess. And it's a harsh word uh, in many ways, obsession. And of course it can be unproductive, uh, but um, I chose that word deliberately because I want people to understand that it's not enough just to prioritize, it's not enough just to focus. You also have to obsess. So let's let's talk about that. And by obsess, what you mean isn't, isn't prioritize, you mean prioritize and then get rid of every other priority except for this one priority that you're obsessing about. Yes, and, right. and, and when you have that one thing, um, you know, you have to uh, do it incredibly well. So let's, you know, a few examples. Uh, so one outside of my study, but I think it's a fa fabulous ex uh, example. It comes from the documentary movie, Jira Dreams of Sushi. I don't know if you have seen it, but yeah, it's a fabulous movie. You should see it, everybody. Um, it is a movie about the greatest sushi chef in the world. Mm -hmm. Now he has a small restaurant in the subway station in Tokyo with a counter for 12 people. He serves 20 pieces of sushi. That's it. And he's perfected it. Right. And so, for example, the way he prepares the octopus sushi, he has figured out that to get the greatest octopus sushi, you have to hand massage it for 50, five, zero minutes. So he hand massages the octopus meat for 50 minutes before he serves it. Now, that is obsession. And you can only do that if you serve 20 pieces of sushi and that's all you do in your life. Right. So, let me, let, so let's let's um, uh, let's test this against a couple of things. Let's look at my own business, right? So you know, I run a consulting company. Mm -hmm. I'm a writer. Uh, you know, I've written four books. I'm a speaker. I run training programs. I coach senior leaders in organizations. I right. coach groups of people. I facilitate team things. I have 30, 40 coaches who do work with us and we put against projects to do strategy executions and organizations. There's a way in which I'm focused because yeah. I'm not also making sushi, right? But there's a yeah. way in which I'm all over the place, right? Yeah. Would your suggestion be, Peter, stop trying to run a company, just be a writer or just be a writer and a speaker, but stop trying to you know, lead a bunch of coaches to do like, am I when you look at somebody who is both has talent to do specific things, but also runs a company? Like, I'm I'm curious about how you view my experience 
and and whether I'm an example of spread too thin. Um, it, it's a great um, example. And so when you ask yourself, okay, am I focused enough? Uh, you have to ask, what is the thing I should focus around? So you might, sorry, let me ask you this question. What are you focused around? What is, if you had to say, I'm focused on one thing, what is that one thing? It's caring deeply about leadership. You know, one of the things that I talk about is that there's a huge difference between success, like successful people and great yeah. leaders. And you could right. be a successful person and a poor leader. It's, yeah. it's unusual that you would be a really great leader and a poor and, and unsuccessful. But, but I really care about how people show up in leadership, in their lives, at work. That's okay. what I care about. So everything I do helps right. people do that, but I'm doing it in so many different ways. Right. You have That's sort of a core, which is that what you just said, the right. content is that one thing, and then out of that you have a set of activities. Right. So at least you're focused, there's, you know, the question you have to ask people, okay, what are you focused on? And, and for any business person, it could be geography, it could be the product, it could be the kind of customer group, it could be a number of things, but there's gotta be something that you're focused on. Um, and then the question becomes, of all the activities around that one piece, uh, are you spreading yourself too thin? But here's the test. I don't know if you are or not. Here's, here's a test. Um, are you able to succeed and excel in every activity you do? Because if you can do one activity and you <clears throat> excel in it, can you add another one and still excel? Can you add a third, a fourth, a fifth? And the moment you add too many or two different ones and you are not excelling, you're just not doing exceptional work, at that point, you're stretching yourself too thin. Right. So that, to give an example from a different uh, business uh, out of New York in my book, uh, Great at Work, there is a story about a businesswoman, uh, Susan Bishop, who created her own executive search firm in New York. Right. She came out of the media industry. She was very focused to begin with. She was doing high level ser executive searches for the media industry. Then she had this idea, I'm gonna please my clients and say yes to everything that comes my way because that's how you please your clients. And she started branching out. Uh, financial services, consumer goods, out of New York, difficult searches, junior searches, right? So you could see that the revenues were growing rapidly. It's a great business, but it wasn't because she started doing mediocre work. I don't have expertise in financial services. We are doing costly services, searches that are outside of New York and right. so on. And she realized we were doing mediocre work in too many activities, Right. spread too thin. So that's the question. That's the that so, ultimate question. So let me, I, this is fascinating. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you on a number of different uh, uh, levels. But let's talk about Susan Bishop because I, I read that in the book and I had a question, which is, so her, what she did was, was de-diversify, right? She, she yeah. divested of all these different elements of the business and right. she went back to just focusing on media, right? right. And then... What happens, though, to her business when media takes a hit? So when the whole idea of diversification is, you yeah. know, sometimes media will be looking for people. Right. Sometimes yeah. financial services will be. Sometimes manufacturing. Yeah. Sometimes high tech. And if you build a business with a lot of diversification, you're yeah. able to manage the, the, yeah. the variations in, in, the, you know, in the flow of business. But if yeah. you just, you know, focus and then obsess on that one thing yeah. and then media takes a hit, her business goes yeah. bankrupt. And I'm Absolutely. curious how you manage that. Yeah. So so in her case, uh, she did diversify in one respect, which was geography. So some of her clients were coming out of the United Kingdom, for example. Mm -hmm. So you weren't relying on just media in New York. So that's one way of doing it. And, and the second thing is that, you know, she could add back on and another sort of vertical, another business. Right. Uh, so you don't have, so focusing doesn't mean doing one thing. Right. right? That's wrong. It, to any situation, it's not about just paring it down to one. Right. In her case, it was, you know, she did pare it down to one and then she added on geography. Um, it's so in your case, it's not about doing one thing only. Right. But the question is how many activities? What, what constitute focus? And there again is a test, can I be, do exceptional work in all of them? Right. Uh, so um, 
but diversification is important because you're right it, it gives you more uh, legs to stand on having said that there is also a curse of diversification that's the hedging strategy I can be in multiple uh, businesses, multiple markets, multiple activities, and some of them will go well and some of them won't, but you know, I, I, net net, I look good. Right. The challenge there, the, the delusion is, um, if I become master of none and just diversifying and being very mediocre in all, right. then you're as a losing proposition, right. right? Because you will be up against people who are specialized, but, but it doesn't mean going all, all the way to one. Well, and also I think the other piece is you could be, I could be a great talent in certain things and maybe even an okay, okay enough talent in other things to make them work. I could be okay yeah. enough running my business, but really stellar at kind of writing and speaking and teaching about leadership. And then it would be a mistake to try to do both of those things because my teaching or my yeah. writing will be limited by my ability to grow the business. Instead, right. if I have someone else who's stellar at doing yeah. that, then right. I could do. I could be the talent that I am. They could be the talent right. that they are, right. and right. and we all succeed more effectively. So, so how you organize? So if you want to have, if you talk about complementors, people who can complement your skill set, right? Right. So if you want to write and you want to run a business and build a consultancy. Well, bringing in some people who can run the business or develop the consultancy side alongside with you right. would be sort of a good good way of doing it, right? right? Because it's hard to do everything yourself, and you know sometimes it's a team sport. Um, so, so, so being focused doesn't mean just doing one thing and exceptionally well. Right. Uh, but, but you can also bolt on too many too many activities. So, give you an example from my line of work. So, I do sort of the same thing as you. I write. I, I teach executive education, I do some consultancy, I haven't built a firm, but I'm doing a bunch of things. So since I'm teaching executive education, I had this brilliant idea two years ago that I was gonna develop an app that I was gonna use in executive education to deliver content. And so executive education participants could walk around and get content from me on an app. So now I became an app developer. How do you think that went? Um, I'm, I'm, I have to, to, to do my coding, <laughs> But ultimately, you have to sit down and saying, is this a good user interface? Right. It became a mediocre app. I sunk lots of money into it, and I closed it down. Right. Uh, too far, too, spread too thin, um, outside of your wheelhouse. Um, so you got to uh, have the discipline to say, what is, I, I like this idea of, of what I call the Occam's Racer in the book, which is, um, it comes from William of Ockham, who had this principle of doing a few things possible, to put it sort of in general terms. How many things can you cut away and how few things can you do and still do exceptional work? Right. That's the that's sort of the question. As opposed to saying, how much can I add in, in a given day? Right. Because that's what I managed to do. I got, I got these amount of people, I got these amount of hours in a day. How much can I do? Right. How about asking the opposite question? How little can I do? and still achieve extraordinary results. How so, little can I do and still achieve extraordinary results? Yeah. That's great. And the answer is not, you know, doing, in your case, it's not doing one thing. Right. It's probably doing a set of things. So let me and ask you a question because- things, Overlay that with your passion and purpose. That's right. sort of the winning formula. Okay, I wanna come back to passion and yeah. purpose because I have a question on that. But when you did your research and you said, you know, you're suggesting that people work less, right? Like how little can I, how yeah. little time can I spend on something? Yeah. Um, but you're still talking about long hours. Like performance yep. continues to go up all the way to 65 hours per week, yep. which is 13 hour days if you're not counting weekends or yep. nine hour days if you're working seven days a week. Yep. So that that's still, you know, that's not, you're not saying like, let's work six hours a day on your passion, yep. you'll be great. A lot of people would still consider that overwork, 13 hours. It's starting at six in the morning and going till seven yep. at night. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So the the data we crunched in the book is we looked at the the performance curve uh, relative to hours on average you work per week, and you're right. It's sort of the curve tops at 65 hours and then it actually declines. Right. right? But notice there was one thing about the curve though. Once you get to 50 hours on average, it starts flattening out. Right. So the bang for the buck from 50 to 65 is actually very very little. Right. So basically my sort of golden rule there is, and this is across professions and across geography, uh, so it's an average, right? Right. Um, it's sort of golden rule is 50 hours in corporate America. And, 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 and then from 50 to 65, you get so little out of it, according to this data, that 50 is a kind of like, you know, stop there. And then instead ask a question, I got 50 hours every week, 
right? How well do I spend them? Right. How well do I spend the 50? As opposed to saying, can I squeeze another 20 in here? Right. And, and notice one thing, um, between 50 and 65, that's where work-life balance takes a hit. Oh, that's interesting. Because you can do 50 and still have a nice life. 65, it gets very hard, particularly if you have, you know, a family. Right. right? So, but 50, you can manage, depending on your commute, of course. But um, uh, and so that is where the, I think the the problem is. I think in a lot of corporate uh, managerial jobs today, people feel they're working more than 50. They are doing emails at night. They're joining conference calls at 9 p.m. instead of being with their family and so on. Right. They're working weekends, of course. Uh, so um, people get quickly up to 60. Um, and beyond 50 is basically a waste. Right. So, so it's really about thinking, okay, restricting yourself to the 50 hours yeah. and then making a decision to say, given that, right. what should my focus be and how yeah. narrow can I make my focus and still make it successful? Exactly. Is yeah. that why you haven't started, you know, you're doing a little consulting, you said, but you're not doing yeah. a consulting company. Yeah. Is that why you haven't started a consulting company? Yes. yes. I don't want to do, I used to be a consultant. I used to work for Boston Consulting Group. But I decided that I'm going to focus on, on teaching, writing, and executive education, and maybe some advising, but not building a consulting firm. Uh, and that's for me personally. Uh, right. The answer will be different for different people. And, and I also learned the hard way I should not be an app developer. Right, <laughs> right, right. Now, was that, you mentioned passion plus purpose, which you call in the book yeah. Inner Motivation. Is that, uh, was that a passion plus purpose decision? your decision to, to focus on executive education, uh, yeah, teaching, great, and writing? Great question. Um, I actually liked consultant quite a bit. Uh, I would say it was a great, great firm and a great job. Um, but you also had to, to prioritize, you know, what are you most passionate about and what are you most sort of perf purposeful about? Right. And for me, it was, um, I rather sort of tried to do some writing to reach many as opposed to spending a lot of my time on a, f a few consulting clients. Right. right? So that's maybe the uh, trade-off you make. So, Morton, you talk a lot. You've talked on the podcast and you talk a lot in your book about this whole idea of focus and the importance of narrowing down. And we're all spread so thin, but the idea of purpose and passion at the intersection of values and really saying no to everything that doesn't uh, that gets in the way of our putting ourselves fully, obsessively into our most narrowly important part of work. And my question to you is, do you have some um, more advice or some thoughts about where people could get started, how they could make decisions about what to let go of and, and kind of giving them a head start on following through on this really important advice? Yeah, you take your job or your role that you're in and you write down a piece of paper, what are the three most important ways I can create value in my job? Value are the benefits for others. Uh, so you start there. Um, and then you might say, well, of those things, you know, what am I, uh, how much the time am I spending on those three? And one of those three might be something you're not doing already. Uh, so it might be uh, if you have a cur current job and you might say, well, you know, there is an, one additional thing I can do here that is not currently being done. And there are some examples in the book uh, ab about this. And many people don't. They, and they spend, uh, so give an example. I spoke to a marketing manager uh, in a high tech company and, and she said, you know, if I, if you ask me that question, I write one thing down, and that is um, uh, supporting major new product launches, and then I ask her, okay, how much time are you spending on that one? And she said, you know, myself and my team are spending way too little time. We spend a lot of time on minor, frequent product launches, but they are not as important. So if we're going to create value for our company, we should refocus on the major product launches, and we are not doing it because we are not optimizing work. That's a very simple example of somebody saying. Um, now I know what to focus on. I love it. So what's the number one greatest value that you're providing? Yeah. And then ask yourself, how much of my time am I spending on it? And, and you look at your calendar last two weeks and you say, well, you know what? It's maybe 10%. Right. Maybe and so, so to, to complicate it a little more, and we've used me as an example in the podcast, yeah. let's just say, for example, my greatest value is communicating to people about leadership and teaching leadership and teaching how to live in a way that, that, that reflects showing up fully as a leader. But if I don't spend time in the marketing piece and building the platform piece and creating yeah. attention on what I write, I could write all day, it won't go anywhere. 
So what, how do I marry those two things where I could say my value is in doing X, but in order for X to be leveraged to make a difference and to create yeah. value in the world, I need to do Y, and then Y becomes a distraction to X. Yes. A great example. I've got two pieces of advice. Number one, you got to say, what is the percentage of my time on an average week that I have to spend on communicating the key value creating? Okay? It doesn't have to be 100%, but let's say it's 30%. Okay? Right. On average, in a given year, I keep a third, at minimum 30%. On that most valuable piece right. okay so that's no and then you track that and if that falls down to 10% on average you're not doing your most valuable thing right but it doesn't have to be 50% it doesn't have to be 100% then the question is for the rest of those what is that I must do second most valuable thing is marketing building the brand okay how much am I doing on that one uh, well if that is also 10% I'm not doing enough and then you look at the things you shouldn't be spending time on let's say admin I'm spending time on processing my bills uh, admin all that stuff is taking up half of my time and I'm not spending enough time on the other two activities right that's how I would do my time budget um, and because we all recognize the things we have to do over time that is not directly tied to the key thing um, so ask yourself what is the threshold of percentage of time and hold yourself to that because in you know in our business um, it's very easy to get caught up in a lot of stuff that is not around teaching and writing and communication. Right, right. I'm going to giving speeches. Right. <laughs> Which is important, right? Martin, thank you so much. This is such a valuable book. It is based on really solid research, and your advice on the podcast is also really wonderful. And I, I'm profiting from it personally, which I really love. So, you know, I've, I've loved your work for some time, and I so appreciate you coming on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Uh, it's been great to be a part of it.